Are you just starting to learn web development and you'd like to know what the most important concepts and things to understand with HTML are? Well, that's what we're going to be diving into in this video, including a few HTML concepts that even experienced devs get wrong. Hello there, my friend and friends, and welcome back to the channel. I'm so glad that you've come to join me once again. And if you're new here, my name is Kevin, and here at my channel, I help you learn how to make the web and how to make it look good with weekly tips, tricks, and tutorials. Normally, I'm talking about the wonderful world that is CSS, but today we're shifting gears and looking at HTML, because as simple as HTML is, especially at first glance, there is a little bit more going on with it, and in certain ways, it can actually get a little bit more complex than you might have imagined. So the very, very first thing is just that HTML is effectively our content that is on the page. We're replacing our content there on the page. And this is sort of like if you were to make a new Word document or a Google Doc and you're typing content onto there, but there's a big difference in that when we're doing it in Google Docs, we have like our settings where you can choose in there that it's a heading and then you can play with your font sizes and do other things with it. And you can sort of organize your content in different ways. When we're writing HTML, we have to be doing that and telling the browser what each individual thing is. So when you have the main heading for your page, do open H1, put in your title, close H1, and now the browser knows that that element is your primary heading for your page because we should only have one H1 per page. And we do that for paragraphs, we have that for links, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But one big difference between when we're doing, say, a Word or Google Doc document and when we're making an HTML page is there's also hidden content on our websites as well. So that's where we have the head versus our body. And the head of our document, this is more like the metadata of our page. And if you've ever taken a photograph, whether it's on your phone or on your digital camera, you can always get the metadata for those images. It tells you the location the image was taken, the date it was taken, the ISO, and all those other things that are related to photography. It saves all of that information. Now, when you look at the picture, you don't see any of that information. Just like all the information that is in the head are things that we don't see actively on the page, but it's extra information in there. And that extra information can be used by search engines to know more about your page. It can be used for when you're sharing things on social networks about what, you know, that preview image and the different things that are coming there. You can include your title of your page, the author of your page. There's a whole bunch of extra information that we can include in there. You're also linking to your CSS files and a whole bunch of other stuff. Now, a lot of those tags are actually meta tags, but we have the other ones too, and they're all, they're all hidden away in the head. We don't actively see them. So I just like to think of that whole area as sort of a metadata area for our site. And then the body of our site, that's the content that users actually see on the page. Now, the next part that I want to talk about is continuing to talk about our tags. And this is the place where even seasoned devs start getting things a little bit wrong sometimes. And that's when we enter into the world of semantic HTML. So if you're looking up and creating websites today and learning about it, you're for sure going to see the word semantic HTML come up a lot. And what it means is tags that have meaning behind them. And we've long had semantic tags. But when HTML5 came around, they gave us a whole heck of a lot more than we used to have. And while I don't want to sort of go through the entire list of everything right now, because there's a long list of semantic HTML tags that we can use, it is important, and I think a good starting point, to usually start by using your semantic tags first, and then go into the non-semantic ones, which I'll talk about in a second. Now, when we're talking about semantic tags, there's actually sort of two categories of semantic tags. We have the ones we've always had, which are our content tags, like H1, H2, H2 three those are all they have meaning our heading one our heading two our heading three we have our a tag our anchor tag to create links that has meaning to it this is an anchor it's anchoring us to somewhere else another location on the web or we have images we're saying this is an image and then the browser has to find the image and place it there and these are all semantic html tags and those are the easy ones because they relate to content and we're placing content on our page so we usually know is it a heading is it a paragraph so I will talk a little bit more about the headings in just a second. But then we have the content version of those, which are the new ones that came with HTML5. And this is things like your header, your section, your article, your nav, your footer, all of these different things. And what I would suggest when you are creating there, when you are writing the HTML for your page is to always start with your semantic HTML tags first. And then when you're really not sure, that's when you can fall back to the ones that have no meaning or the one I should say that has no meaning, which is your div. And a div is shorts for division, but we really just use that to organize content to style it with CSS. So if we need say three columns or something, we might use divs just so we actually can split our content up into three pieces. And the very simplest way to look at it is you have a header usually at the top of your document, often has the logo, your navigation. Your header could also include other things like the title of your page, your H1, uh, and a few other things if you want it to. 
and you can actually use headers in multiple locations, but for now, don't worry too much about that. If you're just learning HTML, keep it very simple. Have a primary header for your page. Then every single page you do should have a main on it. And this is the main content. So this is the real, it's the real meat in the potatoes. All the main content of whatever you're doing should be there. And one very important rule is you can only have one main per page because how could you have two main pieces of content, right? So that's one where it's, this is my main content. Almost everything on your page will probably be in your main. And then at the very end, you can have your footer as well. And a footer is just like the footer of your page, a little bit of extra information, some extra context. There's often another navigation in there if it's a really long page or something that has a lot of different pages to it. And I would really start with focusing on those, your header, your main, your footer. And then we also have a section and an article. And with section and article, those are ones that are often confused with one another and it's when should I know which one to pick. So I will actually include a link down below to a little bit more information on how to choose between the two of them. But basically a section would be a section of content, like a section of a bigger piece of content. Whereas an article is something that should be able to stand on its own. So you'd, you know, you could take that article, something that you put in an article tag and take it out of that page and just read that thing by itself. And it doesn't matter that it's out of context of the rest of the page. Whereas if you took a section of content out, usually a section of content would rely on like other things around it to give that a little bit more context. And you could always include sections within an article as well. And then one really good thing you can do if you're not too sure is to ask questions and ask other people which semantic tag you should be using in what situation or look things up. I'll include some more links down below that can help you out with that. And if you just want a list of tags to remember early on with short descriptions of all of those, I've included a link also to a cheat sheet I have, which are the only HTML tags you need to know for now, because again, there are a lot of other tags out there, but there are these ones that I'm mentioning now that are very useful early on to get you started that you should know. And then, as I said, once you're sort of used to using these semantic tags and you're starting to bring in some CSS and style things up, that's where the divs come in. You've put all your semantic tags, you've organized your page correctly, but now you need to do a little bit more. You need two columns or you need to sort of separate some content in different ways. And there's no semantic tag that you can think of working or you're sitting there going, I, I, if, you know, I'm not sure if I'm using the right semantic tag in this situation or not. You're probably better off in those situations using a div instead of choosing the wrong tag. So if you're really not sure, throw in div for now. And then as you progress in your journey and you're still learning more, maybe the next time you do it, you go, oh, actually, I should have used this tag. So then the next time around, you could use something else. But when all else fails, just use a div and don't, you know, don't use a section when you're really not sure and maybe it should be something else. Just throw a div in there and it will do the job. But really think of divs as I've got my content on the page and now I'm just trying to organize my content in specific ways to make it easier to style with my CSS. Now, as far as the thing that season people get wrong a lot of the time, it's how our heading tags work, which is our H1, H2, H3 and all of that. And what they actually do is they create a document outline or I like to give the comparison to a table of contents where the H1 is sort of the main title that you're going to have for your page, which is different from the title element, which is in our head that we talked about before. The H1 is sort of like the, it's the one we see, it's the main heading for our entire page. Then we have H2, H3, H4, H5, H6, and we have to stop at H6. There's no H7 in all of those. And these create the document outline. We have the main title, and then the H2 is sort of like the chapters that fall underneath that H1. And then an H3 would be a subsection to an H2 that's above it. And so it's really important to understand that we actually create a structure to our document through our heading levels. And if you'd like more information on that, I've talked specifically about it in another video. So that is linked down below. There should be a card popping up and I'll remind you about it at the end if you wanna finish this one first. And the very last thing that I wanna talk about are attributes. And there's a whole bunch of attributes that are out there and it can even seem a little bit overwhelming at one point with all the different types of attributes you might run into. And the one that you're definitely gonna see the most out of anything are classes and there's also IDs. And I find very early on when you're learning about HTML and CSS, you see a lot about classes and IDs. The way I see it though is classes are used for styling things. I use a class if I need to connect it into my CSS or make that link between that element and my CSS file. And sometimes I'll have multiple classes on something to add different styling to it. IDs I don't use for styling if I can avoid it. Instead, I see IDs as a way to link different elements together. We can use IDs to create links that will go to different sections of an individual page. So if you click that, it will actually bring you within that single page to that location. You can also use IDs to link form elements together. So you have a label that can connect to the input and other things like that. 
So when you're making these connections, to me, that's where the idea is useful. Whereas for styling, I like to stick to classes only. Now, outside of class and ID, there are also a lot of other what we call global attributes. And when we say global attributes, it just means that these attributes can be used on any HTML element. Class and ID are two global attributes. And a few other ones that you might see come up are things like content editable, hidden, uh, there's lang for language, and uh, there's a handful of other ones as well. You probably won't be using a lot of the global attributes other than class or ID, or one other one that I do want to mention, which are data attributes. And data attributes are custom attributes that you can sort of create on your own. It always starts with the word data, and it's going to be data hyphen, and then whatever you want it to be. And you can create your own attributes that way. And I'm mentioning it now because while I think that early on in your journey, you probably won't even be worried about it. If you're looking at other sites and looking at other things that are created on the web to study a little bit or learn how things are done, you might see them come up and be wondering what they are. Most of the time, almost all the time, they're there to add some JavaScript functionality because we can use our JavaScript to manipulate those attributes very easily. So usually when you see a data attribute, it means there's some sort of JavaScript that's going on somewhere doing something uh, and creating some sort of interactive thing with that, though there are other use cases for them as well. And you'll probably see them a lot more as you progress through your front end journey. Now, there are a lot of other attributes that are very specific to different elements, such as our form elements, where there's just tons of different attributes and those different attributes really depend on the different form elements that you're using. The most common one you'll see is the input, tons of types of input. So we have to do an input and then we use our type attribute to say what type of input that is. Is it a text field, an email field, a password field? and a whole bunch of other stuff. And that's used for uh, the browser can validate things to make sure it is that type, or it can even change how that item actually works. There's like date time, there's color pickers, all of those things on just one element. But by changing the attribute on there, we're actually getting very different inputs that the user can interact with. Other examples of things that have custom attributes that you'll see a lot are images. Uh, so with an image, you have an SRC attribute, and that is not only specialized images, but it, it's one of the places you can use it. It's not a global attribute that can be used anywhere. So that's where you're giving a source for your image so you can actually link it or our links where we have an href attribute to say where that link should go. We're creating that link or the anchor between that link that we're creating and wherever we want it to go when we click on it. And the last thing that you'll probably see at one point or another are also area attributes and roles. And these are related to accessibility. And this is before when I was talking about using the right semantic HTML, that also falls under the umbrella of accessibility, where we want to make our sites as accessible as possible. And area attributes and roles are different ways that we can do that. What I don't want to do in this video is dive too deep into that because it can actually seem very overwhelming when you first get in there because you're going to see there's a lot to it. But if we use the right semantic HTML, a lot of the stuff that potentially ARIA could do or roles could do, it's handled by that semantic HTML. So that makes our life a lot easier because by using the right semantic HTML, we don't have to worry about that side as much. We're already making our website accessible. But as you're going through your journey and you're seeing things come up with ARIA and you're not sure what they are, what I'd really encourage you at this stage is look up what that ARIA attribute is or what that ARIA attribute is doing. It's one of those things that slowly over time, it would be something that you're continuing to add to your sites and add to the different things you're doing as you learn a little bit more about it. Don't try and learn all of it at once, just like learning everything with HTML at once could be very overwhelming or all of CSS or all of JavaScript. We want to take baby steps. It's the same with when you're learning accessibility. You want to take baby steps with it so you don't feel overwhelmed by it. And if you're learning everything at once, it can also seem very overwhelming. So my suggestion there would really to be make sure you're using the proper semantic HTML. And then if you come across tutorials that are talking a little bit about accessibility, that's a great chance and a great opportunity to dig a little bit deeper and to really understand what's happening there. So if you got through all this, I am definitely assuming you're early on in your journey. So I wanna wish you good luck with your journey. Have a lot of fun with it. Web development is a blast. And as a quick reminder, I promised you that I'd mention it again. There is the video where I dive into the heading levels and how they create the document structure in a lot more detail. So that video for you is right here for your viewing pleasure and linked down in the description as well. And with that, I want to give a very big thank you to Adam, Johnny, Stuart, Tim, and Randy for being my supporters of Awesome over on Patreon, as well as all my other patrons for their monthly support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner on the internet just a little bit more awesome.